Whatever you do on hmm? Okay. Well I'm recording now again. And all I'm doing is showing the announcements. And at six fifty five we're gonna do a plot. At uh, 55, I record it. I do a lot. Do you record the camera? Huh? You can't hear it from me. <laughs> Why did you do that? What happened? I didn't even hear. <laughs> no, I come out of OBS. Much appreciated. What? It's, it's, not, it's not coming out of OBS. Okay, once, once everything gets situated, we'll be back on. Yeah. <laughs>
Welcome, Turning Point family. Good evening. Hallelujah. And welcome, Facebook fans and um, our church family and our YouTube family. Amen. So we're going to come before you today, and we say thank you that everyone's here safe tonight. Amen. So we're going to open up in a um, scripture. <clears throat> Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, and night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, and no, they use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, and their words into the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched his tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to the run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens, and it makes its circuit to the other. Amen? From the rising of the sun to the going down, right? It makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statues of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving glory to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving the light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure and doing forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, and they are more, they are more pure than gold. And they are sweet as honey, as the sweet of the honeycomb. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. By them your servant is warmed. And in keeping them, there is a great reward. But who can discern their own errors and forgive their hidden faults? Keep the servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and innocent of transgressions. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, you are my rock and you are my redeemer. Father, we thank you that you are here with us tonight and you are our hiding place. Your heavens declare the glory, but they have no voice. But we have a voice, so we need to declare the glory of the Lord. Amen. Father, your precepts are before us. They teach us. They guide us. And they are pure words of fire. Let that fire, let that word burn in us, O oh God, and purify us. For your word says that you will guide us with your eye. So let us be in tune with the Lord and the Spirit where he guides us with his eyes. Amen. Amen. God bless. We thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Let's give him a give him some glory. Give him some praise. We love to worship him. Be free in the house. Be free to worship. Be free to clap your hands. Jump, dance. Come on. Don't be shy. Aleluya, gozate. There is a current 
Stirring deep inside, it's overflowing From the heart of God, the blood of heaven Crashing over us, the tide is rising, rising is free. Spring up a well. Spring up a well. Spring up a well in me. Nothing can stop this joy. We're dancing in the streets. Spring up a well. Spring up a well. Spring up a well in me. Break open The cat is free. Spring up a well. Spring up a well. Spring up a well in me. Nothing can stop this joy. We're dancing in the streets. Spring up a well. Spring up a well. Spring up a well in me. Spring up a well. Spring up the well, spring up the well in me. Spring up the well, spring up the well, spring up the well in me. Spring up the well, spring up the well, spring up the well in me. Spring up the well, spring up the well, spring up the well. Spring up a well, spring up a well in me. Spring up a well, spring up a well, spring up a well in me. Spring up a well, spring up a well, spring up a well in me. We come alive. We come alive in you, Jesus. Come on, praise the name. We come alive in you, Jesus. 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 Yes, Lord. Praise the name. Praise his name. Give him glory. Give him glory.
sins being forgiven. Thank you for the freedom in this house. Receive our worship today. You unravel me. sons and the daughters we're the sons and the daughters let us sing our freedom sing it oh
are so holy. You are so holy. You are so mighty. You are so worthy. You are an amazing God. You are so holy. You are so mighty. You are so worthy.
you're at the altar, even in, in the pews, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Allow the Spirit of God to minister to you this evening. That's what we're here for, family. When I was in the back worshiping, the Lord said, I am well pleased with you. And I want you to know that if you're fighting the good fight of faith, family, he is well pleased with you. You might not understand, you might not think so in your own mind, but he is well pleased. He is well pleased. Father, I thank you and I, and I praise you for each and every soul in this sanctuary, Father God, and those on Facebook. Father, I pray that you would minister to them right now where they're at, Father God. To those that are in Facebook, Father, that you would send ministering angels to them, Father. Let them know, Father. Remind them you are well pleased. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you in your presence. We don't take it lightly, Father God. We bless you. We honor you for the opportunity, Father. In your son's precious name, the church and I said, amen, amen, and amen. Let's give a hand clap to the Lord, family. Let's give a hand clap to our Father. Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. You may have your seats, family. us in. It's beautiful. Thank you. We're going to continue in our worship. Amen. Let's give it a round of applause. Time to tithe and give, family. Come on, let's hear it. Come on. There you go. Thank you, Father. This is just another opportunity for us to turn our hearts towards God. Just like in worship when we're singing and we got our hands lifted up, this is just another opportunity for us to direct our hearts towards God. Amen. And before we hand out our tithing envelopes, I want to read a scripture out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And it's familiar. And what Paul is doing is he's speaking to the Corinthians about an offering, a gift that they are gathering together for the, some Christians in Jerusalem. And Paul begins to tell the Corinthians, the point of this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one, of, each one must give as, as he decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Let's stop right there, sister. It's the heart, family. It's our heart. Amen. He says that each one must decide in his heart not to, uh, to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You see, it's not the amount. It's not the amount. It's your heart. Because if your heart's right before the Lord, he's going to give you the amount. He's going to tell you what, what his church needs. Amen? So it's a matter of the heart, family. And I want to encourage you guys to continue to bless the house of God. Continue to give. This is fertile ground. Look around right here. Amen? This is fertile ground. So I encourage you guys to give. And amen. In Jesus' name, let's get that uh, our phone number back on the screen. Go ahead, ushers. If you need an envelope, raise your hand, please. If you guys happen to need uh, our, our uh, what is it called, the, uh, the up-to-date, what is it, the, um, the hipsters, if you're a hipster, <laughs> right, and you want to do everything by your phone, go ahead. You can text the word GIVE to 714-477-7736. One more time, 714-477-7736. Three, six. We just want to thank those of you on Facebook and um, uh, YouTube who have been sending your tithes in. We want to thank you. We've been receiving them. We bless you. And we thank you for continuing to, to tithe here. Amen. In Jesus' name. Go ahead and give. Don't forget to pray over your offering.
Brother Fred and Sister Anna, would you mind uh, praying over the offering, please? loving us for who we are father yes, lord. for changing our hearts yes, lord. every day father just working in us father just continue to work in turning point fellowship we love you lord we bless you we thank you in jesus name amen, amen. beautiful beautiful thank you guys thank you very much um before you before we release the children you may be seated for a quick sec uh Pastor Angel. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give a hand of applause for our pastor. I don't want to labor up them steps, brothers. Man. Uh, just got a quick notice here. Uh, talked about this last week, and we said yes. Uh, we're going to change the, uh, the age uh, children that are going to be going out in the back, the changing of the, uh, for the, classes okay uh the new t starting tonight it's going to start tonight i know it's a surprise but we've had surprises before amen uh the new class age is going to be uh from five to eight is that right five to eight okay where's she at right there five to eight the second class is going to be from nine to eleven and the third class is going to be just twelve and thirteen just 12 and 13. Let me say it one more time. Five and eight. We're going to see how this works out. And then we're going to have the nine to 11 and the 12, the 13. All right? So if you guys are 12 and 13, raise your hand. If you're 12 or 13, raise your hand. You're not 13, little boy. All right? So that's the class you'll be going to. Amen? All right? 12 and 13. Who's 9 and 11? 9-11, raise your hands. Amen. All right, there you go. Those are the classes you'll be going to. You're not nine. Oh, I thought you were nine, sonny. And five to eight. Who's five to eight? All right. All right, there'll be a, all three boys. Lord. <laughs> God give you peace, sisters and brothers. No. <laughs> So those are the classes, okay, that we're going to be taking, 5 to 8, 9 to 11, and 12 to 13. And the youth will be going there. And the youth now know that uh, it's always been this way, but we got a little off uh, court, co uh, course, I should say, uh, that uh, our youth stay the first Sunday, the youth stay in. Okay, every first Sunday, the, the youth will be staying in. I call it old school uh, church. Because in the old days, they didn't have no, no classmate, no classrooms or anything like that. Everyone stood in at the, you know, on Sundays. So uh, you guys will be in, so don't try to not to come to church on the first Sunday and stuff like that. You guys will be here. I'll call your parents if you didn't show up. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, re uh, release our children. Come on. There goes Sonny running down the street. There he goes. There he goes. There he goes. There he goes. And he made it. He's supposed to walk. I just told three other boys walk. Praise God. Amen. <clears throat> so that remember your children's age in classrooms, they they're going to, okay? So we're gonna do that. Uh, go ahead and stand, stand to your feet, please. Uh, well, we uh, I call him one of ours, man. This, this brother, you know, he, he ain't one of theirs, he's one of ours, man. He, He's from Turning Point Fellowship. Amen. 
He wants to be from somebody else, but he's from this side. Yeah, amen. <laughs> We're recording it too, uh, boss, uh, your, your uh, pastor, whatever his name is, Jeff, Jim. Jim, yeah. He's ours too, amen. <laughs> so uh, I want you guys to give him a good round of applause to so Pastor L, amen. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, you guys stay standing. I'm glad Pastor Angel didn't dismiss you guys yet. You guys could, no, 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 you good, you good. You guys could just sing um, uh, All Your Promises, just that faithful part, just a few times, please. Just worship a little bit, just a little bit more. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Faithful, you are. under the sound of my voice that has been dealing with an eye problem. Doctors have tried to call it a cataract or whatever like that. And right now, in the name of Jesus, that blockage is dissolving from the front to the back. That blockage is dissolving because God hasn't created you that way. And all of his promises are yes and amen. You're seeing clearly now by the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. What the enemy meant for evil, he's turned it around for good. And you've started to consider having a surgery. You've started to consider doing a couple of different alternative things. But the great physician is in the house and he's still doing operations. The great physician is in the house and he's still doing miracles. If you'll receive it. If you'll receive it. If you'll receive it. Right now, fluid is moving into joints that have been creaky, that have been aching, or it's been bone on bone. Cartilage is being formed right now under the power and the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If you'll receive it, if you'll believe it, he said, according to your faith, be it unto you. If you don't, then it's not for you. If you don't, then it's not for you. And for those of us that are walking in that perfect divine health, you take that to your neighbor. You take that to your co-worker. You take that to that family member, to that Tia, to that T.O. And you lay hands on them, not in your strength, but in the strength of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just lift our hands and just worship him. And glorify him for what he's doing in this place. Heavenly Father, we yield this time to you. For you to move and for you to do what you want to in our midst. Amongst us. That as the things that you prepared in my heart roll off of my tongue, Father, that they're like popcorn kernels popping on the inside. Vision and destiny and dreams and purpose being breathed in anew. That you would do what you've always done, Father, which is to refresh, to restore, to renew, to reinvigorate. 
to give back what the enemy has tried to steal. Not the material things, but the things that you've dropped in our hearts. We worship you and we praise you, Father, for this time to come around your table to share this meal, Father. And I thank you, Father, for what you're doing in the midst of us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, worship team. All right, you may be seated. It is an honor. It's a privilege. I want to say thank you to the under for the angel of this house, Pastor Angel. And um, like he claimed me as part of TPF, uh, brother's been claiming Pastor Angel as, as one of us. You guys got a brown brother, but he's black on the inside. I don't know if you know that. I don't know if you know that. I am excited about uh, what God has in store for us. I'll give you guys a little pop quiz before I give you the title of today's sermon. I'm going to name a couple of names. And I want you guys to tell me what these people have in common, okay? All right. Here's a couple of names from the Bible. Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, Peter, James and John, and Paul. Does anybody know what those individuals? Sister Olivia. Faith. faith. Yes, they all have faith. All right, now you guys ready for the cheat sheet? Some of you guys are like, I don't want to give a wrong answer. It's okay to give a wrong answer. You don't learn unless you make mistakes. It's not fun if it's just 100% across the board and you're not learning and getting a couple of cuts and bruises, right? That's what life is. That's how we learn to put our faith and our dependence and our trust on Jesus. All right. Abram, Abram went to Abraham. Sarai went to Sarah. Jacob went to Israel. Peter was called Simon, and Jesus called him Peter. James and John, they were called sons of thunder. And before Paul was Paul, his name was Saul. So what do they all have in common? So who said that? Say that again, Jeremy. Their name was changed. Everybody say their name was changed. If you're writing notes, the title of today's message is The Name Changer is the Game Changer. The Name Changer... Because all those individuals that I listed, their names were changed by God, is the game changer. Now, why is that so important? Because if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves doing the same things that we did in 2022 and 2023. Even though it's a new season. God showed me, he, he kind of wired me a little bit like this. I'm not one that's big on New Year's resolutions right at January 1st. If he, the way he's dealt with me, if he wants me to start something in the new year, I'm actually starting it somewhere around December, November. Because I get a running start straight into it. We serve a God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But because we can't fully know everything that he's doing, it looks like it's new to us. If we're following him and not the routine that's comfortable. And not the routine that we can settle in. And we can, when we get into a groove, you can almost do things without even thinking about it. Actually, you'll be doing things mechanically. And, and, and then after the fact, you'll be like, wait, did I just do that? Because you weren't there. You weren't present. And we can do church like that. We can do ministry like that. We can relate to family, to friends, our, our coworkers, strangers like that. Family, the days that we're living in, even the way that we share the gospel with other people, it's going to, Andy was saying this up in the mountain, it's going to be new. Not to God, but to us. Pastor Andrew, I've realized if I, when a person is sharing something with me, if I start trying to give them the solution instead of just listening to them so that I'm asking the questions the Holy Spirit needs me to ask them, in the same old, same old textbook, let me hurry up and pray for you so I can get on my way. When we look in John chapter 4, where Jesus met the woman at the Samaritan well, he asked a line of questions. He's locating her. So even the way that we do ministry for our, the ministers in the house, some that have stepped into it, some that are stepping into it, it's got to be different. It's got to be different. The world is so desperate right now. It's just like, it's like ripe fruit. Like, they're ready to come into the kingdom. They're just looking for the real. 
They've had a taste of religion, gone off, done their thing, realized there's nothing out in the world for them, and they're ready to come back home. But are we ready to receive them? They're not trying to come into the house of God to come face-to-face with religion. It don't work that way. And many of us that used to be in the world, we know the real from the fake. All you got to do is just is listen to a person talk and be like, okay, yeah, there's something off. It, sometimes you just look in people's eyes and you can see, you can actually see the front. Like they're talking, but something else is going on back here. And so it's going to take the wisdom of God. It's going to take the spirit of God for us to get in, in contact and, and get in, in communication and in context with what he set up for us in these last days. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 1. This is kind of like the basis. This is the basis of where we, we hop off of. And um, the name, Matthew chapter 1, the name is so important. Here's how important the name is in the Bible. There were times when Israel was going into, the children of Israel were going into the promised land, and God told them, I'm going to blot these people's name off of the face of the earth that you're about to come in contact with. Now, why would God... Why wouldn't God just say you guys are going to be, you guys are going to win, you're going to be victorious, all this, this, that, and the other. Why does he have to say that he's going to erase them from the earth and their name wouldn't be remembered anymore? Well, there's a couple of things. With our name, there's an identity. With your name comes a personality. Everything that you're attached to is linked by your name. You can be mentioned somewhere else and physically not be there, and when your name comes up, it's going to either bring up good emotions, bad emotions, or no emotions in that room. There's something about the name. Now, I I mentioned all those people, Abraham, whose name means father of many nations, Sarah, mother of many nations, Jacob, whose name was turned to Israel, and we'll get back to Abraham and, and Jacob in a second, Peter, James, John, and Paul. But how many of you guys know the devil? He's real good at this, too. He likes to change names as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. We actually have a list of it in, in the Bible. There's a guy by the name of Daniel who was prophetic, and he would take dreams to God who was attacked many times by laws that went contrary to God. Hint, hint, what's going on right now. Still firm. And when he gave the king his dream, the king changed his name from Daniel to Belteshazzar. There were three Hebrew young men. And, and I, I keep on bringing this up and up and up, parents, because we got to get a little bit more aggressive about praying for our little ones. And when I say little ones, I'm saying anyone who is still in the household. I don't care if you're 19, 20. If you're in the household, you're a little one because you don't pay your own bills. And these young men, we're going to read about them later. These young men, Hananiah, Mishael, and I think I forget the last name. It's in my notes. Their names were changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by the king of Babylon because he wanted, to, that he wanted them to forget where they came from. They were raised to be God-fearing. These were the cream of the crop. And they changed their, he changed their names so they could forget whose they were. Got another guy by the name of Joseph, another prophetic individual, was able to tell the Pharaoh his dream, became second in command, like the vice president, if you would, of Egypt. And as soon as he got promoted, the Pharaoh changed his name. So the devil knows the power of a name because he knows that there's only one name that every knee has to bow And every tongue has to confess, and that's Jesus, including him. He knows he has to bow when the name of Jesus is declared. There's only two, there's only two names that actually matter. There's only two families that actually matter here on earth. You're either in the family of God or you're still under the rulership of the kingdom of darkness. Where did I tell you guys to turn to? Matthew chapter 12, uh, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, there's a basis of this, of where we're going to start. And genealogies could be a little bit boring. Okay? <laughs> if you've ever read the book of Numbers, it's just like so-and-so begot so-and-so, and so-and-so begot so-and-so. And so, but every now and then, God, he kind of winks at us if we take his word 
seriously and not just I'm kind of reading my chapter for the day and thumbing through. Matthew chapter 1, there are 42 generations that are mentioned. Of the 42 generations that are mentioned, the last one, because it's introducing Jesus being born, the last one is what's of importance. I want to actually start in verse, uh, verse 17. It says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. We're going to do a little bit of counting, okay? We'll start in verse 12. It says, after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah, now we don't count Jeconiah because he's the last of the 14 generations of the, uh, that were in captivity. So we start with Sheatel. Jeconiah begot Sheatel. Everybody say one. And Sheatel begot Zerubbabel. Say two. Zerubbabel begot Abia. Say three. Abia begot Eliakim, say four. Eliakim begot Azar, say five. Azar begot Zadok, say six. Zadok begot Achim, say uh, seven. Achim begot Eliad, say eight. Eliad begot Eleazar, say nine. Eleazar begot Mathan, say ten. Mathan begot Jacob, say eleven. And Jacob begot Joseph, say twelve. The husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, say 13. 13. Stop. It's, the Bible doesn't lie and the Bible doesn't contradict itself. It said 14, 14, but we just counted 13. At Jesus, we got to Jesus. The only way I get 14 is if I keep on reading verse 16, which says, Jesus, who is called Christ, say 14. Family, I'm here to submit to you that that Christ is us believers, us Christians. Somebody missed the opportunity to say hallelujah. You're interwoven into the genealogy of Jesus. Okay, I don't, I don't know if you understand what that means. That means when the devil sees you, he's not looking at you. He's looking at the finished work of Calvary. We think that the devil is against us because of the word that we know, because of how long we've been saved, because of how the devil hates us because we look like Jesus. Uh, put up 1 John 4, 1 John 4, 17. The devil, when he sees you in the spirit, sometimes we get so caught up in this natural. He sees the blood of Jesus covering you, which reminds him of his failure at Calvary. The Bible says that if the devil would have known what Jesus dying at the cross would have done, because he killed an innocent man, which violated the law. He could, he could kill everyone because the wages is in of death. He could kill everyone in the Old Testament, but he couldn't kill someone who hadn't committed sin. It flipped his kingdom upside down. That's why when Jesus came back, he said, look, I got the keys to death, hell, and the grave. The Bible said if the devil would have known what he did to Jesus on Calvary, he wouldn't have crucified him. So every time he looks at you, every time he looks at me, he sees people that are part of the family of God. And I'm here to tell you, if we're called children of God, God is what? He's a father, but he's also what? Starts with an L. Lord. Some, who said that over there? Say that again. God is what? He's love. So he's looking at children of love, and the devil hates that. Because it was love that put Jesus up on the cross. It was love that flipped the whole system. If God is love and he's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, because when you see Jesus, you see the father, then that means I've already won. I've already, we've already won. We just got to walk it out. The trophy is waiting for us. We just got to make our way to the finish line. I say it time and time again, I love the motto of this church. You matter. Your story isn't finished yet. Listen, listen, listen. Sometimes the devil wants you to get stuck on chapter one when you got four more chapters, 15, 20 more chapters to go. You're still the same book. You're just on another chapter. And he doesn't want you to get to the end. You have a man by the name of Abram had to believe God for 25 years. 
for a son that God promised him when he was 75. Got into his flesh a little bit. Prolonged it, had a, a son by his wife's maid, by the behest of his wife. And you have to ask yourself, because Isaac's name means laughter. That was Abraham's son that he had when he was 100. His wife was 90. Why would the father of many nations give birth to laughter? Why would he give birth to joy? Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 8. God, who is the father, our father, he wants us to enjoy spending time with him the way he enjoys spending time with us. When we realize, and, and Pastor Angel says it all, this, all the time, we're Christians. We are Christians above being male, above being female, above being Latino, black, white, Asian. What, you're a Christian. If I allow my identity to stay right there with what God has said when he adopted me into his family, when I accepted Jesus, a lot of this other stuff doesn't matter. You don't get caught up in politics. You don't get caught up in racial stuff. You, because you know that it's a ploy of the enemy to get you distracted from this. And that's a game changer. You don't even get caught up in the arguments in your family or in your home. Because you see the devil trying to pull strings and you're like, no, no, devil. I'm coming with the name of Jesus and I'm cutting all strings. We walk in peace in here. This is a house and a place of peace, of love, where the spirit of God moves and dwells in. If we only knew the authority that we had in the name of Jesus. Isn't it interesting that when people who don't even know God, when they're about to get into an accident, they don't say, Buddha or Allah. They always say, God. John 1 tells us that the light that's on the inside of every man when they're born, that light is Jesus. Which makes it so easy for us to call people into the kingdom if we're willing to be led by him. Nehemiah 8.10. Now, background Nehemiah, they had just came out of captivity and they were rebuilding up the walls around the city. But they had haters. They had enemies, so much so that the builders actually had to keep weapons on their waist while, just in case they got attacked. Because their enemies, they knew the stories about what God had done for Israel back in the day. The last thing they wanted was for Israel to be back again. So they're building with weapons on them. And Nehemiah, who was a governor, he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet. He's encouraging them. And send portion to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your what? The joy of the Lord is your what? Some of us have forgotten to laugh because of what happened in 2022. God wants you to enjoy his presence. He wants us to enjoy each other. God is not a... I said it before. If you don't think God has a sense of humor, wake up first thing in the morning, go look at yourself in the mirror. Just stare at it. You'll start laughing. I've done it before. You'll start laughing. God has a sense of humor. And here's a beautiful thing. When that joy comes up on the inside of us, it strengthens us because we're telling the devil, it doesn't matter what I'm going through right now. My God's got me. Well, listen, when we, say, when we say give something to God, you know how you can tell whether or not you're giving something to God if you keep on thinking about it. When I throw trash away in my kitchen, I don't go and tiptoe over and be like, let me make sure that this container is still in there. No, it's thrown away. It's given to the trash can. We got to get like that with the things that the enemy tries to weigh on us. Listen. If God has done it before, what makes you think he can't do it again? If he's done it before, if he's come through for you and your family and finances. And here's the thing. You didn't even know how it was going to come. That's what's so bomb. Okay. We just dismissed the, t the children and the teens out. You think they're thinking about how, how are we going to pay the rent next month? Where are the groceries going to, is mom or dad going to have enough money to put in the tank for gasoline to take? I mean, the prices are so, you think that they're doing that? 
as children of God, why are we doing that? Why, why are we doing that? Turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 32. We're going to look at Abraham's grandson, Jacob, whose name was changed, changed to Israel. And I don't know if you know this or not, but all those people that I mentioned, their names were changed because they went through something. They experienced something. We've all experienced something. Even if your, your life has been a bed of road, we're going to see, because remember, we're in Jesus' genealogy. We're going to see what we've experienced. And in Genesis chapter 32, now the cool thing about Jacob is his name actually means deceiver. You know anything about how he was born? It was actually prophesied uh, to his mother, Rebecca, because she was having this war going on in her stomach. And Jacob has an older brother named Esau, and they are literally having war. And God is like, look, it's two nations. They're going to be going at it. So Esau puts his hand out. And then Jacob goes ahead, and he's like reaching for it. And Esau, he's actually born, and he's like a hunter. He's the apple of his father Isaac's eye. Jacob, he's, you know, like a farmer. His mother loves him. And Jacob actually tricked his son out of his birthright. That's kind of been lost in our Western world. Because both of my parents are from Nigeria, it kind of carries over as far as the weight of an elder son. And I think a few cultures in here, maybe the weight of an elder son, what that means, what he's supposed to do, how he's supposed to take the helm. And Jacob tricked his older brother into allowing him to have the first, the, the birthright. So when he was blessed by his father, he had the blessing. And blessings carry a lot of weight when they're a God blessing. And he runs off because his older brother's like, I want to kill him. He runs off. How many of you know that if you leave a situation without it being resolved, you're actually going to run into that same situation? Because it's not the situation that's not resolved. It's something on the inside of you that needs to be worked out. Jacob, the deceiver, the trickster, he ran into his uncle Laban, his mother's brother, who was a bigger tricker and deceiver than him. Tricked him so that he had him working twice the amount of years that he said he was, 14 years. He was only trying to work seven. And then he was trying to cheat him out of his wages of what he was supposed to get of flocks and cattle. Jacob is like, I have had enough. I get it, God. Like... Okay, cool. I got an issue. All right, I'm changed. Like, I'm good. Sides to head back home. On his way back home, this is where we take off in Genesis chapter 32, because he wakes up in the night, and he decides to wrestle with somebody. Now, his name still means deceiver. Let's pick up at verse 22. Um, actually, yeah. It says, and he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabuk. That's Jacob. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, how many of you guys know you can fight with God, but your arms are too short? As a matter of fact, you fight with God, you don't even have knuckles. So it's kind of like you're just doing this. He touched the socket of his hip, the man who Jacob was wrestling with, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, the man that Jacob was wrestling with, let me go for the day breaks, but he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Underneath all that deceiving, underneath all that tricking, underneath all that playing around, Jacob knew that who he was fighting with was greater than him, and he wasn't willing to let go until he was blessed. Like a pit bull. They say they get locked jaw, right, when they bite onto something. He was like, no, no, no. He said, I just want, and mind you, now he's disabled because the man touched his hip. He was out of joint, and he's still wrestling with him. Some of us go through stuff, and the first place we want to stop going is church. Where there's healing, where there's love, where there's a word in due season. 
and you fall in hook, line, and sinker for the devil's trap. If he can get you separated from here, you're on your own. You're on your own. Some of us, we don't want to get corrected. We don't want to get rebuked. We don't want to get set straight. And it's like you're in the kingdom of God. You're in a family, in your own family. You don't let your kids, I hope you don't let your kids just do whatever they want to. I hope. So how much more with him? And God is, a, it doesn't get any better than him as a loving father. You trusted him enough to give him your life, but you don't want to do things his way, and you expect things to work out, all the promises? The Bible says that whom the Lord loves, he chastises. Proverbs says that if you love your child, you discipline them. Verse 27, he said to him, what is your name? The man said that. He said, Jacob, and he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. The only one in here in this book who has the power to change names is God himself. So this is Jesus pre-incarnate. This is the, 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 a lot of times we'll call him the angel of the Lord because Jesus was always with God, but it's time to be born, as we read in Matthew. And he's coming. He has the authority to change names, and he says, Your name is no longer Jacob, it's Israel, and Israel actually means prince with God. Last time I checked, my Bible said that we're joint heirs with Jesus. That means that the benefits, the inheritance that Jesus has, I have access to it down here because I'm joint with him. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he's my advocate. He's my lawyer. I don't need a retainer because he paid the retainer in his blood 2,000 years ago. And he said, in verse 28, he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with man and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Back in the Old Testament, if you saw God face to face, you were dropping dead. Part of it is because if you see him face to face, you know where he's going. We, that's why God hid Moses in the cleft. He was like, you see my hind parts, you're not going to see me face to face. But when Jesus showed up in a physical form, now and then, there's a few people like Samson's parents that were able to see him. Nothing but the grace of God. It says, therefore, I'm dropping down to verse 32. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank which is in the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the muscle that shrank. So for the rest of Jacob's life, we can't even call him Jacob, the rest of Israel's life, he walked with a limp. Now there's a couple of things that are important about that. His name prior to meant deceiver. When you read in Ephesians, the armor of God, the loin part, the belt part, is our loins are girded with truth. Jacob came face to face with the truth of who God was. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What it also tells me about this limp that Jacob now has is he has no other choice but to be dependent on God in order for him to walk correctly. That staff, that's to help him. I shared this before in Psalms 23 where it talks about the rod and the staff. When a shepherd is, is actually, when he's leading his flock, thank you, when he's leading his flock, if you have a rogue sheep that just wants to do its own thing, the shepherd will on purpose break the leg because now that lamb or that sheep only has three good legs and it has to stay close to the shepherd because he's just slowed it down. And don't worry, it'll heal, it'll get stronger, but he had to do that because it was either going to fall into a ditch, get eaten for its own good. Family, I submit to you, if you got to get your heart broken by, by anyone, you'd rather it be God. He may not cause it, but he'll allow it so you can come back home because your name is changed. You belong to him. Bible says that we're not of our own, that we were bought with the price. Some of us like to go to the grocery store of heaven and try to get a refund for
The enemy is on borrowed time. The, enemy, the devil's on, he, listen, it's not even borrowed time, it's stolen time. The Bible's very clear that whatever he, has to, he takes from us, whatever he steals from us, he has to repay seven times four. We got to stop looking at this and start looking at the one that can do the impossible. If he's giving you a dream, if he's giving you a vision, who said it's too late? Who ta- that, that was a question that God asked Adam in the garden after they ate the fruit that God told him not to, that he knew that they were going to do it because he said, in the day that you eat it, it was a matter of time, when Adam was like, we hid because you were naked, God said, who, who told you that? That's important because the words that we hear, they actually feed our spirit. When we feel like we're sluggish, when we feel like we can't go on, when we feel like we're down and depressed, I submit to you, have you eaten today? When was the last time you had a meal? Look, I had a, I had a, uh, turn with me, uh, turn to Galatians chapter 5, please. I had the opportunity to uh, go to a funeral today for a good friend of mine's, uh, his, his grandfather. And I was, you know, going back and forth, should I go, should I not go, and I went. The minister said something. Now, I know this minister since I was a kid. And he said something awesome. He said, if some of us would eat this, like we eat regular food, we'd be in a whole lot better shape. That's, that I think it was the second to la- uh, the last song, that, the second to last song before often that we sang um, about in your presence. Some of us in here that may have struggled with going to sleep, the pills ain't going to work. Listen, you can go to sleep and wake up tired than when you went to sleep. Because it's not about the physical, it's about your soul getting rest. It says, in the glory of your presence, I find rest for my soul. Now, I'm not a big advocate about using this as a sleeping gate, right? But sometimes when you, I mean, listen, the itis is real. You eat sometimes, you want to go to sleep, right? Sometimes just spending some time in here, it will put you at such a rest and at ease that you're, Nothing around you has changed. The bills are still there. The calls are still coming. But on the inside of you, something different has happened. The argument and fight is still brewing that you have to deal with with your spouse. But on the inside of you now, you got to pee. There's no anxiety. There's no anxiousness. Because on the inside of you, something is different. Because you've been spending time. In his presence. Galatians 5 20. Uh, it's not, I'm sorry, Galatians 2 20. Galatians 2 20, my fault. Galatians 2 20, it talks about our life that we now live. It's not our life anymore because we're bought with the price. I've been crucified with Christ. Remember, I said your name gets changed when you go through something. We were with Jesus on because Jesus wasn't dying for himself, he didn't have no sins to die for. He didn't do anything. The Bible says that he was tempted in all ways and he was without sin in Hebrews. So if he's on the cross dying and it's not for him, then it was for me and you. And it's, not, it's the whole identity thing. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Family, we, we, we have to realize, we have to remember that no matter what we go through, that God is still with us, that God is still for us. Listen, sometimes we think that Jesus didn't really go through anything that was heart-wrenching, where there was nobody, and I've been there, where you don't feel like there's anyone around, like you feel like you're alone. Yeah, you got people you can call, but in that moment, in that place, in that space, someone else to understand what you're going with, going through. Yeah, Jesus, he, Jesus went through some things. Um, Calvary, for one. He only had two disciples there, Peter and John. The other ten is split. The Garden of Gethsemane, he kept telling his disciples, hey, pray with me, pray with me. And they kept falling asleep. When Lazarus passed away. And he's crying, not so much because his, he already knows on the inside what he's going to do. The unbelief, the doubt. These people had already seen him do miracles. And he's like, dude, just believe. Just believe. 
just believe. When Peter denied him, even now when we do things that he's told us not to do, we act like we, act like we can't break God's heart. When he gave everything to get us back into the family. And it's not breaking, it, uh, breaking of his heart to where it's a depression all this other stuff. But hurting. think of the times when you've told your kids not to do something and they did it anyway. And you hurt more for your kids than what they felt. Part of it sometimes is you're blaming yourself because you're like, what could I have done better? Maybe this is a result of what I did back when I was doing my thing. That's a lie from the enemy. God has given us all our own will. Every person is responsible for their actions. But I tell you what you can do, you can continue to pray and set that hedge of protection around them. I tell you what you can do, you can continue to apply the blood of Jesus over them. I tell you what you can do, you can continue to declare the authority that God has given you over your household. It works. I'm a product. Hit by cars twice. And I'm not talking about in a car. I'm actually talking about walking. And I get up and I'm asking the person who hit me, are you okay? I got, I got praying parents. I got people in the church that are praying for me. Another time, I think I shared this story. I get hit. I'm flying up in the air. And I remember how high I was because I turned over my shoulder. I was like, wow, I'm really high off the ground. <laughs> on the way down, I feel arms that are carrying me. And then this, like, this far, I fell down. And the car keeps on running into a Mexican restaurant. Just destroyed. It, it was a brick wall. And I get up. And I go over to the, one, the girl who is, she's crying hysterical. I think she's thinking she's killed me. And I'm like, hey, are you okay? And everybody else and their mom and all the establishments, they're like, you should sue her. Wait for the cops. I'm like, no, nah, for what? I'm good. That's not L. That's the prayer of the saints. Listen, if you're like, your kids are doing good, pray for somebody else's kids. It can't just be about us four and no more. Our, listen, my family is worldwide on every continent, on earth and in heaven. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 1. We have to realize where our identity is. When, when That phrase, identity politics, it's actually a ploy of the devil to confuse us because you don't know where are you going to be? Am I going to be right? Am I going to be left? Am I going to be my ethnicity? Am I going to be my denomination? Is it because I grew up in this city? It's just a fracturing. Jeremiah chapter 1. Now, that genealogy thing that we looked at in Matthew, the revelation that my pops taught me years ago, that was before any of us were born. That's how far ahead God has thought about us. That's how Jesus said it like this. He knows how many hairs are on our head, all of them numbered. Why wouldn't God care about what you're going through? He's the only one who could do something about it. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctify you. I, adorn, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now, maybe you're not a part of the fivefold ministry gift, but God still knew you. The man of God said earlier, we all got a purpose. We all have a calling. We all have something that God has called us to do. Are we doing it? The fulfillment and the joy, it doesn't come from the money, doesn't come from the job, doesn't come from the relationship. It comes from knowing that you're doing what you were placed on this earth to do. Because he's wired us that way. He's, and listen, here's the thing. When you're doing what you're supposed to do, it fits with everyone else. The body is joint and it's knit and every part is supplying what it needs. Other people are getting what they need. If we didn't have ushers, if we didn't have service, if we didn't have worship, if we didn't have, if we didn't have people who God laid it on their heart for them to go ahead and to teach the children and the youth right now, you might not be receiving as much as you are right now. Those are people that are doing what God has called them to do. And here's the thing. We can't get upset at the process. God will show you 
the end from the beginning. But that doesn't mean he's going to show you what's going on in between there. Because it wouldn't require faith. You're just like, oh, God, I'm waiting for this to happen. I'm waiting for that to happen. He shared with you how he started in the parking lot. How he started as an armor bearer. Walk, listen, the, one of the hardest things as a believer to do, and this is why, and this, is, this is part of, of, of the title again, being a game changer. When you feel like you're up here and then you have to walk away from it all. And you got to trust that God will give it all back to you. Because the church that he went, I know the church that he went to. Beautiful church, awesome church. And to walk away from that and to go somewhere like Abraham where you don't know but you trust God, that takes a lot of faith. There's some of you, a lot that are watching, a few here, and God has been dealing with you about changing your schedule so you can be in service. Look, it's not about the tithes, it's not about the offering, it's not about any of that. It's because he's trying to deposit something in you. The beautiful job of a pastor is they get to see the giftings and the callings in people. And when it's time, God will go ahead and use them to go ahead and call. But if you're not showing up to the game, how can the coach put you in? You can't complain about riding the bench when you're not even coming to practice. Like you should be warm in the pine. You're not coming to practice? Oh, well, I know my seat is going to be warm when I'm done. You, you got to show up. And it's not even, listen, showing up to church is practice for when you're by yourself at home. Will you show up when it's time to spend time with this? Will you show up when it's time to pray? Will you show up when he wakes you up at 2 a.m. and it's not the pizza, it's not the menudo, it's not the burrito, it's not none of that intestinal stuff going on. You just can't go to sleep because he has the right to wake you up so he can talk to you. Will you show up? And I'll be honest, there's been times where I'm like, God, let me catch you in five. And I flip back over, and I can't. Sometimes he won't let me. Other times he'll go ahead and let me. And I regret it because I know if I had been obedient, there would have been a download. Maybe not for right then, but definitely for later on. This message right here, God gave me a couple of weeks ago. I get the text. I'm like, all right, Father, what are we doing? I just waited, just waited, just waited. Just waited. He's like, why don't you look in your notebook? I was like, oh, yeah. Because he knew. And he put the other pieces together. But if I hadn't shown up, turn to Hebrews chapter 9. I promise you I'm almost, I'm almost done. You know, there's a song. There's a song that we sing that I love, Supernatural God. You've never been defeated. You've never lost a battle. Through you all things are possible, for I know you're a supernatural God. We were singing it one time on stage. The Spirit of God just hit me. Boom! He was like, you've never been defeated. I said, excuse me? He was like, you've never lost a battle. I said, wait, wait, wait. Can you get us? He said, through all things are possible because you serve a supernatural and I was like, whoa. I'm a join heir with Christ. Oh, have I gone through some things? Yeah. But the game isn't over yet. Have I lost some people along the way? Yeah. Have I experienced some setbacks yet? Have I sabotaged myself a little bit? Of course. But we still got a couple more quarters. We got a whole nother period. We just went into overtime. Because I can't lose because of who I'm joint with. Look, and, and my name is actually, my name means nothing's impossible with God, which is cool. But I would rather be called a follower of Jesus, a Christian, because it's higher. It's higher than that. The identity of what he did on my behalf is greater than that. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16, it says, For where there is a testament, there must also, be the, uh, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. What is it talking about? All the promises that are in the New Testament. When Jesus died, th this is actually a will, like a will that you would have. When Jesus died, that cracked open every single promise for you and me. He had to die. He had, the will was already written. He had to die so we could have access to it. 
We get to access divine health, speaking to our bodies, telling it that it has to obey. Listen, it's getting to a point in a time where the only option that we have is God. Actually, this is a point in time. Even finances, where the only option, because on purpose, he will allow the people that you normally would call, the creditors, all these other things to get blocked so that you can rely and trust on him. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says what? Trust in the Lord with what? Part of our heart? With all of our heart and not to what? Lean on our own under, not to, to be like Jacob and to lean not on what I think, but to lean on him. Because if I'm not leaning on my own understanding, I have to rely on him. What is our own understanding? When we can figure out A, B, C, and D. What is our own understanding when we have a plan but we haven't consulted with the ultimate planner who is God? What is our own understanding when we do what James says and you plan out all this stuff about how your future is going to be and you don't even know the length of your days? What is our own understanding when we're quick to run to a solution, we're quick to run to the phone, we're quick to run to other people? Sometimes God will remove God sent people. Sometimes God will have them pull back so that you're not leaning on your own understanding of trusting what he gave them, but you come to the source. He'll do it. He'll do it. He needs to. Why? Because it draws us closer. It draws us closer to him. Where did I tell you guys? To oh, okay. <laughs> we can't be so busy mourning that we don't see the morning come up. Say that again. You can't be so busy mourning, being sad that you don't see the morning rise of what he's doing in your life right now. See, turn to Psalms 119, please. See, darkness and night, they get eaten up by the light. The way that we have our calendar now is actually opposite. You go to Genesis, it said evening and morning were the first day. 12 hours of dark followed by 12 hours of light. For it to be a sign to us, no matter how dark things are going, you got a whole nother half that's brighter than what you just came out of. In Psalms chapter 119, verse 130, it says, the entrance of God's word brings light. I'm telling you, family, if you are confused, that's not God because he's not the author of confusion. If you're at a crossroads and you don't know what to do, that's not God. Listen, God doesn't wait until we get into situations to tell us. He tells us before. That's his character. I heard Pastor Angel say a lot of times this is an open book test. It is with the answer circled. <laughs> So when I teach and I give my kids, like, a study guide, and they're like, Mr. O, I still failed the test. I'll be like, okay, we're taking it together. Like, there, there's no, and I don't even do anything. I'm just like, okay, go, go and look at that. And I won't give it to them because I realize that they didn't apply themselves. And I'm like, did you see that before? No, I really didn't see that. Yeah, because you didn't go past slide one, but it's okay. We're in this together. And we have the Holy Spirit to help us as we go through this. Together, with us. It says, the interest of your word gives life. It gives understanding to the simple. Listen, when we get in situations, and we turn, we don't lean on our own understanding, we ask God, he'll actually bring up on the inside of you what he told you a while back. But you were too busy to see. It's like, it's like Google Maps, right? You're going, you're going, you're going. And all of a sudden, if you're not paying attention or you listen to music, it'll be like, make a U-turn. It's like, why am I making a U-turn? Well, because you didn't see back then when it told you to make a right or a left. So now it's telling you to make a U-turn. And even when we're like, man, I got this. I don't need no map quest or anything like that. And you end up in Tarzana when you're supposed to be in L.A., <laughs> Google Maps is still saying exit, 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 and go on the opposite. Same thing. Because God wants us to win. He's still saying exit, 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 so you can go back and do what I've called you to do. Psalms 
Turn with me, please, to John chapter, or actually Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to read one more scripture and then we're going to end after this. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Oh, cool, it's up here. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. A couple of things. It mentions the blood of the lamb, which is the blood of Jesus. But then it says the word of their testimony. If you know anything about blood in the Bible, there have been times, and it's actually said um, twice, where blood, which is Leviticus 17.11 says the life of the soul is in the blood, right? Where blood that was shed, that was innocent blood, cried out for justice to heaven. Because that's the soul. The soul is associated with our personality. It's associated with the name. So it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, which is Jesus' blood. But then it says by the word of their testimony. Why is that so important? Because it's saying even though you and me didn't shed any blood, we still have rights to say what Jesus said over our situation. It doesn't say they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony. It says there. It's including us with Jesus. And when you apply the blood to a situation, you basically tell the devil to back off heaven property. The power of the blood is so, it's so, we see it here on earth, it's so strong, kingdoms get raised and kingdoms get brought down. When you have monarchies, royal families, they need whoever, they need offspring to carry that bloodline. Well, I'm here to tell you, family, we carry the bloodline of Jesus. Last scripture, Romans chapter 4, verse 17. You see, we're to let the world know that their name has been changed and show them their new birth certificate of his love. That's why it's so important to know who we are. You get caught up with how you look and what you're involved in, you'll miss it. The devil wants us to be distracted. Our job is to reconcile the world to God. Our, God, our job is to let them know the love of God so they can have an experience with God like what we've had. Romans chapter 4, verse 17, this is the last scripture. It says, I've, and this is God talking to Abraham. He said, I've made you a father of many, of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Over my finances, I'm prosperous. When I walk out the door, my children walk out the door, my family walks out the door, no weapon formed against them shall prosper. And every tongue that rise against them will be condemned. I have sound mind. I don't care about the prescription the doctor is giving. I have a sound mind. I am confident. I don't care about a speech impediment. I don't, listen. The things that are the hang-ups are the things the devil is using you to stop you from realizing who you are. Moses had a speech impediment, and he asked God if Aaron, his brother, could speak for him in front of Pharaoh. Yet when we read the scriptures, every time he got in front of Pharaoh, Aaron never said anything. Moses always spoke because he was locked in to his dependence on God to do it. I don't have anxiety. I'm not depressed. I don't have mental breakdowns. I walk in a sound mind with love and power. You got it? We just read it. He calls those things that be not as though they are. My name has changed. My identity is different. I don't care about the designation they gave you when you were five years old. I don't care about any of that. The devil, listen, if it's something the devil cares about, then we shouldn't. If the devil cares about it, we shouldn't. And how do we know? Just read the book. You'll see what God thinks about you. You'll see the thoughts that he has towards you. And anything opposite than that is the devil. Wives, speak over your husbands that they are confident, that they are led by God to leave your family, that they have the wisdom of God, that they're loving, that they understand what you need, and that they are great husbands and fathers. Men, Call your wives Proverbs 31 women. And if you don't know what Proverbs 31 is, read it. 
Don't call them my old lady. Because that's not who they are. That's not their name. That's what the world would call them. That's how the world would have you perceive them. Call them beautiful. Call them loved. That your heart is towards them. That they're righteous. That you're all that they desire in a wife. And then you both together begin to declare the promises over your children. That they will not go through the pitfalls and the things that you both went through in your youth. That they have the wisdom of God, that they grow in understanding and intelligence. That they are a light and a beacon. Family, our name has been changed. And if we're willing to fully embrace who we are in Jesus Christ, the game it's totally different because you're looking at it through the eyes of a winner in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you and I praise you, Lord, for this time that we've had to share in your word. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for the seeds that have been sown. And I thank you, Father, for the root going deep down into the hearts, Father, and the harvest that will be grown as a result. I thank you and I praise you, Father, for keeping us, Lord, and reminding us that we belong to you. Reminding us, Father, of what you said over us. Above what we hear in the world, above what we hear with all the voices that are going on around and that we perk up our ears when your spirit is speaking to us in the midst of chaos and noise. We perk up our hearts when you want us to move in things that may seem uncomfortable or unusual, but because we know that you're in it, we go all in. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. That was rich, man. I pray that the Lord open up your hearts and your mind to the understanding of what was just spoken to us. That's some good stuff. That's, uh, that's not fundamental stuff. Amen. That's some mature stuff. So, uh, it was good. It's rich. Amen. We're going to go ahead and, uh, uh, well, he already prayed it out. So, <laughs> thank you guys for coming out. Don't forget this Sunday we have our uh, Sunday service. Amen. Uh, coming out. Anything else? Oh, tomorrow we have our leadership. You know, uh, you got an invite. So, come on out. You guys who are in leadership, come on out. That's at 630. We're going to be having our leadership. So, uh, we'll be talking about some things that we need. Amen. Amen. Uh, what else? That's it, huh? And then Sunday we have service. All right? So you guys uh, shake each other's hands, hug on somebody before you leave, smile at somebody at least. Amen? You, know, you guys are dismissed. We love you guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>